Let's get to know Giantinetti a little better. Last TV show you binged? Oh, A Heart Stopper on Netflix. Favourite radio station? The Sound. Favourite music genre? Oh, anything that's from the 80s. Beer or wine? Don't drink alcohol. <laughs> PC or Mac? Mac. Drive yourself or take public transport? Uh, both. Council or commissioners? Uh, commissioners. Favourite evening meal you cook yourself? Chicken. When was the last time you cleaned your toilet? Oh, probably in the weekend. Right, okay, on to, on to serious matters. You entered Parliament five years ago in 2017. What can you say you've done for Tauranga in that time? Actually, I was thinking about this over the weekend and quite a lot in that I've got uh, had a lot of people that have come through the electorate office and so we've been able to help advocating for a lot of people in different areas and I would say well in the hundreds, uh, particularly over the COVID time in that we've had people that we've able to be, been able to help with work situations, with uh, immigration situations, supporting people in any uh, housing areas that they've needed help with. But apart from that, I've also been able to advocate for Tauranga. So uh, being able to see, help Wellington people understand the needs of Tauranga. And you can start to see that coming through now with the investment that the government is making into infrastructure needs in the city. And that's because I've been able to, to be there and be that person on the ground that can then take that back and tell the key ministers what is needed in this area. Also, and I don't think this is something to be taken very lightly at all, I've been to so many events over that time. And I think it's particularly important because I've been to groups who have needed a push on their, uh, their causes that they are in behind. So breast cancer, for example, because it's breast cancer month at the moment. So I've been able to get in and support those and give it a little bit of an extra push, uh, but also getting there and bringing a message from government to many of the different organisations. And I love connecting with the people. And when I connect with the people, I have a really good understanding of what it is that they want for this city. And again, I'm able to take that back and have that in conversations at the table and I think that's really critical. Being at the cabinet table I'm able to have those conversations around what is needed in this city. What's the single biggest issue facing Tauranga that's so important you die in a ditch over? That's something else I've been thinking a lot about lately. Obviously with a by-election here, uh, you know, People will say a lot of things around Tauranga as being there's a lot of need um, infrastructure wise but I, I challenge that because what we're seeing now is we're seeing an investment uh, that we haven't seen before and I think that that's really exciting but we need to keep that going. We need to make sure that all people in this city are well looked after. We need to make sure that everybody's needs is coming through to the fore and what I would die in a ditch is, is to make sure that all of our people are sharing in the prosperity that Tauranga, Tauranga is experiencing because it is doing really well coming out of the COVID environment uh, but every, everyone needs access to that future prosperity and that's what I would die in a ditch about. Whether that means that people are adequately housed or whether they're getting the right supports that they need, uh, we just need to make sure that everybody is being listened to. Youth crime is in the news a lot these days and on the rise. What's the solution? You know, I am Associate Minister for Education and uh, when I'm down in Wellington I'm doing a lot of work around uh, how we can engage young people right from the word go in education. We need to take a holistic look at what is happening and we are taking that look. My uh, vision and what we're working on is creating a system that works around the young person, not uh, the system, not the young person needing to fit into that system. Because we all know that there are young people who have a myriad of issues and problems. And so we need to make sure that we're working with those young people. Now our alternative education, we need to make sure that we have an alternative education system that is working with the needs of those young people and that's what we're developing at this present point in time. It is really 
important that we take an all of government approach to this. It's not just let's be punitive about those young people because that's not going to solve anything. We need to ensure that we are looking at the whole issues that those young people are bringing to the table and what's in behind uh, that youth crime and what's happening. I will say that while we've had uh, much of this in the media in recent times, youth crime has been on the decline. But that doesn't mean to say that we don't do anything. We've got to make certain that we're bringing that all of government approach to it. And what would you say to the voters who demand stiffer sentences to, to discourage young people committing crimes? You know, have a look at how that has worked in the past. Has punitive actions solely towards uh, young people solved anything? If it had, we wouldn't be in a position where we were talking about this right now. Don't get me wrong, when people break the law, there does need to be a consequence, and that's incredibly important. But at the same time, we need to be talking and working on solutions that go a bit further than just a punitive approach. Tauranga grinds to a halt every rush hour, but no one, or at least not enough people, want to take the bus. Can we just afford to keep building more roads or is there a line somewhere where that just has to stop? I think we need to look again at a much broader issue here. We have an issue with climate change and we can't afford to be just building roads. That is part of the solution. But if we just build roads, we know that the research tells us that we will have more cars and eventually those roads will be clogged as well. So we need to be looking at an enduring situation with uh, roads and public transport and good public transport that is responsive to the needs of the people. That will also address our climate change uh, emissions needs that we have, to, we have to be taking very seriously because if we don't, we're not going to have a future planet for our future generations and we need to be thinking of what our mokopuna, our grandchildren, need to see in this city as well. How do you get people out of cars? We need to incentivise uh, public transport. Hitting the nail on the head there, it needs to be responsive to the needs of the people and there's some really good um, ideas that are coming to the fore around that. You know, some of our areas in New Zealand are doing this much better than what we're doing here in Tauranga, but I know that at a regional council level where they have these discussions, they're talking about how they can, and designing a system where they can make public transport more responsive. But then you're right, how do we get people into it? So there needs to be incentives around how we get people into it. I don't know what those incentives look like at this point in time, but these are discussions that people need to tell us. And they need to say, well, this is what would get me into public transport. Maybe even if it started in a small way. I always say, start your habits small. I, uh, when I'm using public transport or when I've got meetings here in town, I try and have uh, one day, even a fortnight, that I've got meetings that I can get on the bus, go into town, have the meetings, come back on the bus. Then it might be two days, uh, and then it might be three days. So it's just about starting small and realistic. I really like what happened with the uh, the taking the public transport or the bike to work on the Wednesday idea that came through. Initiatives like that make people think and also start that change in people. But we need to look at how we can incentivise people to do that and we also need to look at making sure that the system fits their needs. How has Tauranga benefited from Labour's management of COVID? Well, I think I'm really proud of our COVID response for a start. And I think the fact that Tauranga uh, came to the party and got a highly vaccinated population within the city, uh, double vaxxed and then the booster was a credit to the city and the residents of the city. The fact that uh, throughout that time we managed to keep our health system uh, with as minimal stress as possible, it's not going to be perfect, but as minimal stress as we possibly can. Also, I have people who tell me all the time 
they kept their jobs because of the wage subsidy. And I see that out and about. I have uh, business owners who tell me they were able to keep their business going because of the supports that the government was able to give to those businesses. You know, people are really grateful, but people are also really tired of COVID. And, and we're all at that level. We've been living with this for over two years now. It is tough and we get that it's tough, but at the same time people have been incredibly grateful for the supports that have been shown to them over that time. The cost of living is affecting everybody, some more than others. What tangible things can a government do to address it? Cost of living is just tough at the moment. We've got COVID and we've also got the overseas situation with the war in Ukraine and it's putting all these pressures on supply situations. But we've already seen that we've been able to do a little bit to do this, like alleviating the fuel prices uh, and the increases that we were seeing in the fuel at that time. And also going back to say that we've made public transport half price so that people can realistically take public transport as well as an alternative to uh, getting in their cars. But we can also look at uh, how we've um, worked with the benefits, the, the April 1st changes that we were made and plus the raising of the minimum wage. Those are all tangible uh, parts that the government can make changes with. If elected, what's the first thing you do for Tauranga? Well, the first thing I'd do is make sure that I've got enough resourcing to help the people uh, who will be wanting to access the electorate office. So at the moment, we've got a much smaller team here. It really puts a lot of pressure on uh, that team when people coming through the door. So we would need to make certain that we were uh, making sure that we had enough people to help. But at the same time, uh, I would be out there telling a story of a tauranga that's really got a positive vibe about it, making sure that the people in Wellington know that Tauranga's got this incredible opportunity to do amazing things. This is an important city in New Zealand Inc. It's an important city uh, for uh, this area because it's growing so fast and it's such a wonderful place to live, work and play. But I also think that uh, we need to tell the story that the city has changed quite a lot from what it used to be and what people used to know even 20 years ago. We've got this growing diversity in the city that I think is something to be celebrated and we need to see those people at the table as part of the decision making processes of the city as well. And I look forward to being able to tell that story so that we can get even more supports into this place. And last but not least, tell us a little bit about yourself in 60 seconds or under. <laughs> uh, so I'm a mother of two adult sons uh, who both live in Auckland, although one of them's in Saudi Arabia at the moment. I'm married, I love Tauranga, came here in 2006. It is my what I call now my spiritual home. It is where I want to be, it is where I want to retire, it's where I want to be for the rest of my, my life. I love this place. I just am really looking forward to this campaign uh, because I get to connect with so many people throughout the campaign and I want to tell the story of Tauranga being the incredible city it is.